Hello and welcome to another blistering episode of Almost Breaking News right here, right now on the Fully Charged Show. Coming up, half of Europe's EV chargers are in Netherlands and Germany. What? A battery made of dope, man. I mean, that is way cool. Running your house 24 hours a day from solar and neighbourhood batteries. Another chapter in Toyota's slightly painful electric car journey. Pricey electric car chargers at Glastonbury Festival and a funny old Frenchman who's scared of electric cars. All this and more on Almost Breaking News from the world's number one home energy and sustainable transport channel, the International Fully Charged Show. Okay, before the first story, a quick update. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that we're gearing up for Fully Charged Live USA, powered by Electrify America, this September in San Diego. Yes, we're in California mode, and we recently chatted the ocean breeze with Henrik Fisker and took to the Pacific Coast Highway in Rivian's R1T. There's more North American content coming to the channel soon, including the Ford F-150 Lightning, Tesla's Model S Plaid and the hotly anticipated solar sensation that is Aptera. You'll be able to see all of those and much more, including our home energy advice team, Electric Avenue, Electric Concepts, Ride and Drives and dozens of live talks at the San Diego Convention Center on the 10th and 11th of September. It's the world's number one electric vehicle and home energy show, and we're expecting thousands of EV-ready, energy-savvy consumers. So join us and a host of other YouTubers for a fantastic show. Tickets are available today at fullycharged.live. And now, on with the news. OK, first story. A new report suggests that around half of all the publicly accessible electric vehicle chargers in the EU are in the Netherlands and Germany. Now, some of you might immediately say, hang on, Robert, Norway has more chargers than anyone else. And you'd be right. But of course, Norway is not a member of the EU, even though it is part of the EEA and the EFTA and the Schengen. Not that this is a in the least relevant to this story, but I just wanted to point out that Norway has a very beneficial and close economic relationship with the EU, that's all. But this story is about charges in the EU and they're not evenly distributed. It's the same the world over. Today, in 2022, electric vehicle chargers are not evenly distributed. Here's a question, will they ever be? Here's an answer, yes, they have to be. But new data analysis from the European Automobile Manufacturers Association points out that the Dutch alone have as many chargers in the Netherlands as 23 other member states combined. I can verify that from personal experience. It's very easy to charge an electric car in the Netherlands and Germany. So although there are already 307,000 chargers available in the EU, that number needs to triple and be evenly spread out to make a genuine impact. And while we're on the subject of chargers, here's a report from our roving reporter, Imogen Pierce, who's somewhere in Oxford. Now, Imogen, Imogen, can you hear me? Imogen? Yes, Robert, can you hear I... Me? Can you hear me, Imogen? Yes, Robert, I, I can hear you. It, uh, it is, in fact, 2022. So, I am reporting not quite live from a car park in Oxford, but this is no ordinary car park. No, this is home to a brand spanking new 42 fast and super fast chargers as part of the energy super hub Oxford. But the fun doesn't stop there. With 10 megawatts of installed capacity from a direct connection to the grid, this is entirely renewably energy generated. And with a 55 megawatt hour battery on site, it means that it could provide renewable energy when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. As a scalable project, this can scale up to provide charging for 400 electric vehicles and has even gone so far as to provide 60 heat pumps for local social housing. But, as you can imagine, such a collaborative project has required an enormous amount of partners from Oxford City Council and Pivot Power and a whole host of others. But maybe the most intriguing thing of all is that this is home to not just one, not two, but three charge point providers all battling it out for your EV custom. Who will win in this race? I don't know. I hope they all fare well and I hope the planet fares even better. This is Imogen Pierce reporting not quite live for Almost Breaking News. Back to the studio. 
Thank you very much, Imogen. And uh, well, I, I like it because I used to live in Oxford and I've got a few pals who live in the area. So now I can stop, have a charge and maybe drop in for a cup of tea. Anyway, moving on, next story. Now, when I was a lad, cannabis was often referred to as Indian hemp. Oh yeah, that's what we used to call it. And that wasn't strictly true because hemp is a very specific type of the cannabis plant and it is very low in THC, which is the active ingredient that gets you stoned out of your brains. So you, have to, you would have to build a spliff the size of a roll of carpet to get high smoking Indian hemp. <laughs> But humans have used the long, fibrous hemp plant to make ropes, clothing, building materials and food for centuries. But some proper boffins at the Texas-based startup BEMP Research Corps uh, claim to have developed a hemp-based lithium-ion battery alternative. What the what? Hey man, if your battery catches fire, call me. I'll come over and hail. Awesome! So now they are in the process of trying to commercialize its B4C hemp short for boron carbide made from hemp, lithium sulfur battery technology. And the reason for the, all the interest in this development is it's all about the weight. If this technology comes to fruition, it will mean lighter, more energy dense batteries, clearly ideal for transport uses. Now I've often said that somewhere, someone is going to come up with a new battery technology that will be a bit of a game changer. I want to modify that as clearly there are going to be numerous new battery designs. New materials used, new chemical makeup, energy densities, but higher energy density and cost variations that are all going to make a small step towards a sustainable energy and transport future. The more cheaper, long-lasting and sustainable electricity storage systems we can develop, the more renewables we can use. Now, as I speak, and I've just checked, wind is generating 56% of the UK's electricity. Yes, there are times when it's down as low as 10%, but the fact that it's possible on a normal working day to produce over half our electricity from wind right now, not solar, just wind, that is truly extraordinary, and we've only just started. Next story. Now, here's two words I've never put together before. Neighbourhood and battery. This was a dream I had a few years ago. In fact, the BBC made a documentary about me trying to install effectively neighbourhood batteries in my village that I live in. But sadly, we failed. We were there too soon. We were ahead of the curve. We were pushing the envelope and we tore it. But this story from Australia fills me with hope because if we could have installed a community battery or a neighbourhood battery and spread the cost between all the villages, then we would all have benefited a great deal. This is from the website of the Australian Labour Party who recently won a bit of a landslide election there. And it's apparent they have a slightly different approach to Australia's energy supply than the bunch of coal-obsessed drongos that were in power before. So I'm gonna read this out in, a, in an Australian accent just because, well, no reason other than I quite enjoy doing it. So what they said was, a community battery is typically the size of a four-wheel drive vehicle and provides around 500 kilowatt hours of storage that can support up to 250 households. It just makes good sense to share a single community battery instead of expecting every household to pay for the purchase, installation and maintenance of their own battery. Now, can I just say, all other considerations aside, to hear this kind of common sense from any politician is incredibly refreshing at the moment. Moving on. Toyota. Oh dear. Now, just to put all this in context, I've had a long and very happy relationship with the Toyota Motor Corporation stretching back a couple of decades. They have a fantastic reputation for making incredibly well-built, reliable cars. I owned a number of Toyota Priuses and indeed that was the start of my and many people's journey towards using electric cars. Sadly, my relationship went a bit sour with them recently when Toyota coined the term self-charging hybrid. I was not impressed because it was a subtle dismissal of the notion of plugging in a car while you're not using it. It basically said in the subtext, don't be a tosser and drive around looking for a socket to plug your massively compromised battery electric vehicle into. Drive this self-charging hybrid and you never have to plug it in. Of course, it worked from a marketing perspective. They have sold metric shit tons of Toyota and Lexus hybrids. But even Toyota have had to face the fact that hybrid sales are dropping and pure electric uh, sales are increasing at a massive rate. 
Now, I could sit here and list the long established car, uh, car makers who have already sold hundreds of thousands of electric cars, some good, some bad, some indifferent, but they have been doing it for some time now and they're getting better at doing it. It would be a long list and I don't have the time, but as many regular viewers will know, Toyota, for reasons best known to themselves, decided battery electric cars were never gonna work and they followed the hydrogen fuel cell route. Nothing wrong with that. I drove the Toyota Mirai and I loved it. It's a very fine bit of engineering, but it would be fair to state that up to this point, it hasn't exactly taken the world by storm. And Toyota have pumped billions into trying to make that work. But essentially, and again, it comes as no surprise, that eventually Toyota were going to be in a position where they had to bring out a battery electric car. Of course, they've been selling them in China for years, but that's another, that's another topic. Now, I'm not sure if and when we're going to get the chance to review the new Toyota BZ4X. That's what it's called. But I just wanted to give a bit of background. And to be honest, I haven't paid a lot of attention to this car until recently when a very difficult story emerged. Toyota issued a recall on 2,700 BZ4X electric cars, basically all the ones they've produced to date, over the potential of wheels actually falling off the car while it's being driven. Now, I want to state right now that this has nothing to do with the fact that it's an electric car, and it shows that Toyota are responsible and determined to make safe, reliable cars. Millions of cars get recalled all the time due to some defect or other. Ford, General Motors, Tesla, Peugeot, and many others have already had to recall cars for updates and parts replacement this year alone. But it's really not a good look. The first battery electric car to come out of a company that has, at senior management level, something of a history of holding very negative attitudes about electric cars, a company that is still heavily promoting hybrids, i.e. petrol cars, and this is the first electric car they're selling outside China. As I say, recalls are nothing new. And in fact, many of the 2,700 cars affected haven't even been delivered to their customers yet. This is brand new, out the, fresh out the gate car fresh out the factory, but the reviews we've seen of this car are not exactly inspiring. I was hoping that Toyota have come, to, come late to the market, but then they would then present a imp seriously impressive new technology, game-changing, smaller, lighter vehicle that wasn't just another mid-sized sort of SUV. Hey-ho, they've got stuff in the works, maybe one day. I mean, the Prius was such an amazing, properly game-changing technological advancement. I just hope Toyota haven't lost their mojo baby. And here's another electric car story which illustrates the speed and scale of the shift away from burning fossils. Fiat, the Italian car maker, have just stated that they will no longer sell any pure combustion engine vehicles in the UK from right now. Their entire range will be electrified from now on. Yes, right, not, not in two or three years, basically now. And I did say electrified, not electric. So basically, apart from a couple of proper electric cars, the rest are petrol cars with small batteries. So petrol cars. But here's what the boss said recently. Fiat CEO Oliver Francoise stated, between 2025 and 2030, our product lineup will gradually become electric only. This will be a radical change for Fiat. It is our duty to bring to market electric cars that cost no more than those with internal combustion engines, as soon as we can, in line with the falling costs of batteries. We are exploring the territory of sustainable mobility for all. This is our greatest project. Hmm. Well, fair point, Oliver. And all we can say is, take the hint, other car makers, produce good, small, reasonable ranged electric cars and people will buy them. And if you're not sure about what Fiat have to offer, have a look at this uh, Panda E, which is coming out next year. Super small electric car, I like it. And as Hyundai are showing again and again, it is possible to produce incredibly efficient, incredibly attractive electric cars that people are literally queuing up to buy. This rather beautiful machine is the Hyundai Ioniq 6. Ooh, yes, nice. Now this car isn't due out until next year, but I can see this is gonna be is going to cause a lot of interest. Hyundai had asked uh, Jack and I repeatedly to go and see the Ionic 6 when they had it in the UK for like one day. Sadly, we were already booked filming other things and we couldn't make it. Very frustrating, but we will get a very early test drive of this car soon. The two cars I'm noticing out on the roads recently are the Kia EV6 and the Hyundai Ionic 5. Not only are they rather unusual looking, but really popular cars. It's the underlying technology they have developed that's genuinely impressive. And not to be all Hyundai fanboy about this, 
There is another, what I would call, car coming out next year, the Volkswagen ID Aero 01. It's not an SUV-styled vehicle, and VW have gone all out for energy efficiency. The Aero 01 has a 77 kilowatt hour battery, which they are claiming is good for 385 miles of range. This car has a drag coefficient of 0.23, and for comparison, the recently featured super efficient Lightyear 01 has a drag coefficient below 0.2, and that is crazy low, so the VW isn't too scruffy. Looking for some sunshine and clean air? Well, where better than Southern California this September? We're bringing all of the electric vehicles under the sun and an array of clean technologies to America's finest city this fall. Yes, that's right. Fully charged live USA, powered by Electrify America, is coming to San Diego. So for fresh perspectives, exhilarating test rides, electrifying live talks, and all of your favorite YouTubers, Get your tickets today. One last thing, almost last thing. Glastonbury Festival has just taken place in the UK. It's huge. Hundreds of thousands of people attend to see some wonderful young musicians and performers and a few seriously old rockers. <laughs> But as with everywhere else, the number of people travelling to the event by electric car has increased dramatically. And to be fair to the festival organisers, they strongly recommend on their webpage, uh, they strongly recommend to people to charge their cars as much as possible before entering the site. However, they did offer a couple of rapid charges on the site, and because they were charging fifty pounds, which is about sixty euros or fifty-seven sixty dollars or fifty-seven euros for one charge, it got into the local press. Now I'm not judging that particular aspect because the event is held in fields normally inhabited by cows. There's not a lot of infrastructure. But fifty quid? They're having a laugh. Yes, everything has to be brought onto the site, but these charges were powered by wretched diesel generators in 2022. Come on, Glastonbury. If there's one place where this sort of half-baked nonsense should not, should not exist, it's at this damn festival. Emily Evis, festival organiser, said that they, are, uh, they, that they are the only festival with a conscience when it comes to the climate. OK, so next year, do something about car charging. As one thing is certain, there will be a load more electric vehicles coming to the festival. And this is critically important. There are perfectly valid, plausible alternatives to filthy old diesel generators. You shouldn't be using any on the site. One company, ZPM Energy, it can supply much cheaper, much more reliable uh, car charging with no diesel involved. Their Zap Store is a shipping containerized unit that stores around three megawatt hours of electricity and can be charged off site using renewable energy. This can charge over 50 electric cars at a fraction of the cost. And this isn't a plug for ZPN Energy, there are other systems available. I've seen them in use at test drives of big car companies. So there are literally zero excuses anymore. All the energy used at big festivals like Glastonbury should now be from renewables, not bloody diesel. Oh, and sorry, this is one last, seriously, this is the last thing, definitely, definitely last. See if any of you, any of you in the UK specifically can guess who tweeted this. Uh, electric cars and smart meters at home will give the government power and control over our lives. It is the big brother state and it's all under the conservatives. <laughs> Now, many of you outside the UK won't have heard of this dirty little snot goblin. He's called Nigel Farage. He's a British nationalist, ultra-right-wing extremist with a French name, LOL. I normally make great efforts to avoid anything to do with him, but this tragic little tweet leaked into my consciousness. I can only assume, as all the other arguments pumped out by the fossil fuel lobby groups start to collapse in a heat of, heap of self-loathing misery, the more extremist nutters are trying to come up with new and even crazier notions of why it's better to stay with the freedom we experience from importing expensive fossil fuels from dangerous criminals and brutal monarchs around the world. Uh, just to put this saddo Farage in perspective, he's a massive fan of President Putin, close friends with old Trumpy pants, and he appears on a tragic little TV channel, which, thank heavens, no one watches. 
So that's all we've got time for. Please do subscribe to The Fully Charged Show. It really makes a difference. It costs you nothing. really helps us. Have a look at the Patreon, uh, uh, Patreon link that's in the show notes of this episode. And before I go, I just want to thank a few of our fabulous long-term Patreon supporters who support us with $10 a month or more. Absolutely miraculous. And they are Larry Enoxon, Roy Spencer, Sean Hart, Thomas Nyrud, Rowan Richardson, Chris Margetts, Urban Linderskog, Paul Compton, Craig Hind, Henri Portelli, John Capps, Carlton Topham, Megan Grant, Pavel Golovkin, Jiri Stansty, Ross and Nicola Wood, Peter Kier, Ronald Heaver, Melanie J. Schneiders, and Laura Sanborn. Thank you so much for your support uh, of the Fully Charged Show. It makes a huge difference. It's why we're still here. If, if we didn't have Patreon supporters, we would have collapsed a long time ago in a heap of self-loathing misery. That's all. I'm going to shut up. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching. Well, thank you so much for watching that episode. We hope you enjoyed. Robert's just having a little lie down because he's a bit pooped from filming that. So while he's doing that, let me tell you to watch this episode here. If you like that one, you're going to like this one. This is our most recent upload. Here is a link to subscribe to the channel. And this is a link to our Patreon, if you fancy it.